All right, we're in 1 John chapter 1. The first epistle of John is an excellent source to go to study and understand what it means to stay in fellowship with God, which is the first step every Christian must do in order to do anything onward in the Christian life unto spiritual maturity. We looked at that, and I thought, well, let's look at it again in a little more detail, because there's so much misinterpretation possible here, especially in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart me he can do nothing. And then verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. Does that mean he goes to hell if you don't, you're not faithful? No, because we're talking about discipleship and abiding in fellowship with God. Well, let's take a look at that chapter in a little more detail. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Jesus is the one true vine through whom all fruit is born. The disciples had a different understanding of the word vine from Old Testament Scripture. To them, the vine meant Israel. In a sense, outside of the context of this verse, it does. Verse here. But there can be another meaning. He says, And the Father is the gardener who is intimately involved with his creation. My Father is the gardener. In Old Testament Scripture, God is spoken of as the owner of the vineyard of Israel. This is a concept from which the Jews held that God was a distant God, did not involve himself intimately with the day-to-day -day lives of his people, except at times to judge. But here our Lord... Jesus Christ, in John chapter 15, is saying something new. That God is not the only owner of the vineyard, but he is a God who takes intimate and exacting care of his vineyard. And our Lord further says that God the Father himself was taking care of the vine, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, in his humanity. God the Father is the vine dresser, the husbandman, who the Lord testifies is intimately involved, involved on a moment-to-moment -moment basis caring for God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his humanity while our Lord walked the face of the earth. As the Father is so intimately involved in caring for the Son, so he is also involved with caring for believers, the branches of the living vine, as the Lord attests to in this passage. So Dr. McGee, in Through the Bible, tests, states, in the Old Testament it is prophesied that the Lord Jesus would grow up before him, before God, as a tender plant and a root, out of the dry ground, 11, Isaiah 11, 1. Now we look at verses 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So he doesn't cut off the believer from God, meaning sending him to hell because he doesn't bear fruit. It's talking about how a gardener prunes a fruit vine. And if the vines that don't produce fruit, he cuts off. But the branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. That's the believer. So we get tested and put under testing so that we will bear more fruit. So Dr. McGee brings out the key to the passage in John 15. The branches must be joined to the vine. For what purpose? He says, for fruit bearing. So the purpose discussed here in this passage is not salvation. Our Lord is speaking to his disciples, Peter, James, John, and all of them, his own disciples who were born-again believers, with the exception of one Judas Iscariot, who no longer walked with Christ in the pretense of being a disciple. Jesus is speaking to them on the subject of doing divine good works, of bearing fruit. He is not teaching on the subject of receiving or keeping one's eternal life in heaven. Let's keep in mind that we must not draw meaning from this parable unless our Lord does so himself. Instead, we are to discern only those relationships between individuals and activities in the vineyard to which our Lord refers, and only in the specific ways in which he refers. The subject at hand that our Lord is speaking about is the bearing of fruit of his disciples, and by application the bearing of fruit of all believers. Our Lord therefore speaks about the process that a husbandman, a caretaker of a vineyard, goes through in order to get the branches of the vine to produce fruit. 
He prunes the branches that bear fruit in order that they may bear more fruit. He cuts off the branches of the vine that aren't producing fruit at all. So you don't cut off a, a, a believer, a child of God, a disciple, and throw him into hell because he's not producing fruit for the moment. Now these branches which he has cut off, he throws away. These cut off branches wither and are thrown into a fire and burned. Keep in mind that this is the normal way a vine dresser tends to his vineyard in order to produce fruit. And all of this activity that our Lord is speaking about is relative to the producing of fruit in his disciples, born-again believers, who are secure in their eternal destiny with the Lord in heaven. Ephesians 1, 13-14. Keep on reading to get the meaning. Salvation is not in view in this passage, but loss of fellowship with God is. It is that fellowship word. The description of the cutting off and burning of the non-fruit producing branches does not correlate to a believer who does not produce fruit being cut off from eternal life. This becomes clear when verse 10 is considered. Read verse 10. If you keep my commandments, Jesus says to the disciples, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this verse confirms that salvation is not the subject, especially not losing it, when our Lord speaks of abiding, for Jesus is telling the disciples to abide and others remain in his love by keeping faithful to what he has commanded them to do, just as he has been faithful to the Father and has abided in God the Father's love. So our Lord cannot be describing the maintaining of his own salvation here, for he is God. He is, however, speaking of maintaining his continued fellowship with God the Father. If he doesn't, is he going to go to hell? He's God. So what John... John 15 2 does teach is that the value of an unfruitful believer's life is as worthless as those branches which are cut off and which wither and are burned. Furthermore, other passages indicate that the unfruitful believer is cut off from temporal fellowship with God until he becomes fruitful again by abiding in Christ. This is what we're looking at in John 1:10. 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 10. Salvation is not in view in this passage because it would then teach the false doctrine of loss of salvation contradicting the rest of Scripture. The loss of salvation must not be read into this passage, and so many do, especially at the violation of other clear passages in Scripture that maintain a person once having believed is permanently secured for eternal life in heaven and cannot lose his salvation, fruit or no fruit. For example, I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. He who at the moment of time, in time, exercises a belief in Jesus Christ as his personal Savior will at the moment have everlasting life. If one has everlasting life, then one has life which is everlasting. One is in a state of living forever with God from that moment. They'll then get a resurrection body and be completed in their redemption. This forever state by definition cannot be interrupted or lost because it would not then be everlasting life that the person received when they trusted in Christ as Savior. It would have to be something else. If it is not everlasting life that one receives when one believes in Jesus Christ as Savior, John 6, 47, then the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, is a liar for some saying something that is not true. And our Lord again said, John 5, 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has ever, eternal life, everlasting life. And I will not be condemned, for he has crossed over from death to life. But if you lose your eternal life once received in ten years, it wasn't eternal, it was ten-year life. That doesn't make sense. Our Lord goes one step further and unequivocally states that whoever believes in the fact that God the Father sent Jesus to be that individual's own personal Savior has come into the possession, the experience of having, present tense, eternal life. Yes, it is true that the person will still die physically, but now, having believed, he receives eternal life, and he will most assuredly go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven forever, and not the lake of fire. For our Lord states that that person will not ever be in danger of being condemned again. Read it again. I tell you the truth, whoever, believe, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and that person who believes will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Jesus said above that the person who trusts in him as Savior has passed, crossed over from death, condemnation, into hell, to life, everlasting life. 
by definition of the phrase has eternal life, which our Lord spoke in this passage, one does not pass back and forth between having eternal life and then losing it, once more to be in a state of eternal condemnation. One more set of passages which nails the door shut on being able to lose one's salvation for any reason. Ephesians 1, 13-14 And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance unto the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. A seal. A seal means something which is permanently affixed and not to be broken until the final act of salvation is accomplished, and that of going to be with the Lord in heaven in a perfect state of righteousness, a perfect body. God himself seals the believer's eternal destiny with him in heaven at the moment that that person trusts in Christ as his personal Savior. He seals each believer unto the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now you look at Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve, he's talking to believers, the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, and final redemption when you received your perfect resurrection body. Redemption of those who are God's possession. The experiential redemption of all believers when they finally receive their perfect body. All believers are promised by God to be redeemed at the point of their trusting in Christ as Savior. This is called the positional redemption. Then believers are permanently placed by God in the legal position of already having been saved. And after this, even God's in God's time, according to his plan of the ages, each believer will receive his resurrection body and spend all eternity with him. That's the final redemption. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 4-6, which also teaches positional redemption. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And then verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now that's not actual in experience yet. It's it's judicial and positional. And God judicially placed the believer with Christ in heaven at the point that that believer trusted in Christ as Savior and his mortal body in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Through Christ, God expresses his kindness and we experientially, in the end of the age, get to be in heaven with him forever. So now it's just a matter of waiting until God completes his sovereign plan of redemption and salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So now it's just a matter of waiting until God completes his sovereign plan of redemption, saying all of those in history who will trust him alone in his Son alone as Savior, then saving them, then the final step of all believers of actually receiving one's perfect body will be done. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and 48 to 9, 49. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead? Believers, compare verse 48 below. The body that is sown is perishable, is raised imperishable, and was as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, so also are we who are of heaven, believers, previously quoted in Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. And in verse 49, And just as we believers have borne the likeness of the earthly man, since all men were born in Adam under sin, so also shall we, believers, bear the likeness of the man from heaven. So, we are God's possession, deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, this holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit, we're indwelt with him, marked him with a seal until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So salvation is not in view because faith is not mentioned in this passage in John 15. The Lord intended for the lack of fruit in a person's life to be an absolute indicator that that person is not a believer, that that person has never trusted in Christ only as personal Savior, then he would have addressed the lack of the missing element of faith in the ones who lacked any fruit in their lives. The element of faith is not mentioned at all in his discourse. The concept of faith in him as Savior is absolutely crucial to the Lord in the understanding of his gospel. More on this next time.